Um, so I, I've uh, noticed a couple of people I mentioned my talk yesterday and about how they like the history, and I was going, "Well, gee, that was my future. That was one of my future talks." <laughs> Uh, and actually, today's talk is more is more history oriented than uh, what I did yesterday uh, when I was talking to Andreas about what I might talk about and stuff. One of the things he said, "Can you tell us about jigsaw?" And uh, if you don't know what jigsaw is, we'll get to it here in a bit. And I said, um, "Well, I don't think I can give a whole talk about jigsaw, but I, I can talk about things that kind of led up to it and and and." How things that I've done uh, when I was intimately involved with small talk in the area of uh, modularity and support for for team software development using uh, uh, using small talk, and so that's what we're going to talk about today is kind of uh, how this all started and, and what it led up to. So. Um, so I, when I first got involved with small talk, I was working at a company named Tektronics. And those of you who have a bit of gray hair probably may know Tektronics more than some of the younger people. But uh, Tektronics still exists. But in its heyday, it was one of the world's leading electronics companies. Uh, you know, in the 60s and 70s, if you were into electronics, you might uh, sort of a good analogy might have been you know, Tektronics and HP were kind of comparable to, well, so, so Microsoft and Apple, maybe, for PCs, uh, although they were more comparable in size than, than Apple and, and Microsoft. But they were kind of the two leading companies that were driving the entire electronics industry and stuff. And so... So they were sort of the, really the source of innovation and stuff. And, and, and Tektronics happens to be located in Oregon. And I even went to high school with the son of the founder of Tektronics. And uh, so he helped me get my first job there and stuff. But Tektronics, in addition to doing oscilloscopes by then, uh, were also doing graphics terminals and so I had desktop terminals that did graphics and stuff. And so in 1980, uh, Tektronics had a group called Graphics Computing Systems, and that's where I was working. Uh, and, I, and what I was doing at the time was I was actually building a Pascal compiler, a Pascal compiler for the brand new Motorola 68000. Uh, we actually had pre-production units we were compiling against. And the idea was to use Pascal as the systems programming language uh, for products that were going to be then built on the 68,000 and embedded in various hardware platforms. Uh, one of the things that was built was GCS Pascal, was a little desktop computer that was kind of disguised like it was an instrument, uh, uh, yeah, and it was used to implement BASIC. Uh, another one was actually a file server, a networked file server that uh, exists before we had networks like Ethernet in it, and it actually used these thick instrumentation cables to plug computers into this thing. And, and Rebecca was actually uh, the software project leader on that. But these were, were built using that Pascal compiler. And uh, one of the real focuses of that particular Pascal compiler uh, was, was modularity. Now, those any of you, if you've studied Pascal or the original Pascal, Pascal was originally uh, a teaching language. And, uh, Pascal programs were typically single file programs and stuff. Uh, and, and for uh, building products, we knew that we couldn't do an entire product with one big single file program that a whole team was working on. And so uh, at Tektronics was very interested in modularizing small talk, providing uh, uh, some sort of modularity, sorry, for Pascal's and some sort of modularity model for Pascal programs so you could mix and match pieces of code together. And, and there are some standardization efforts in this. And so that was one of the, one of the features of uh, the Pascal compiler we built, is that it supported this uh, modularity model. There were uh, modules were called units. There were exports and imports, and you could tie them together. And, and this view of modularity that was in Pascal 
Uh, you can kind of think of what it really that view of modularity, it's, it's source code modularity it's all about, is, is that ideally, you know, in the ideal world, you just have this one big program, but it's too big for one person to work on, and so you need to cut it up into pieces, but you want to be able to reassemble it and everything to fit together, and so the imports and exports are kind of where the pieces fit together and stuff. But it's, it's important to think of that sort of modularity is, is, is abstracting actually over the source code. It's not a runtime concept of anything that, has to do, anything that happens at runtime. It's just a, how do you organize and structure the actual source code. So, uh, oh, so it can be put back together. Yes, indeed. Uh, so, so, so we, we built this Pascal and we, compiler, and we did, it was more or less completed. And we were working in this little advanced technology group uh, and we got this invite from uh, Adele Goldberg at Xerox Park to participate in this experiment to first uh, review the draft of a book that became the Smalltalk Blue Book, um, and then to try to implement Smalltalk on a computer, quote unquote computer, that Tektronix would build. Now, at that time, Smalltalk was mostly a big mystery to the world. There was little hints and rumors about what Smalltalk was, and I'd seen Alan Kay speak somewhere, and uh, one of my one of my colleagues, uh, Paul McCullough, actually had a friend who worked for Xerox, and he was kind of feeding us rumors and stuff. But Smalltalk was really a big mystery about what it was all about, but everybody said it was the greatest thing in the world. <laughs> so. So, 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 so we had this project, and we uh, we reviewed the book, we uh, and we got the tape, and the tape was, I mean, this was a big nine-track magnetic tape, and it was a virtual image. It was the virtual image dump off of Xerox Dorado, uh, and um, in the black of the blue book, the back of the blue book, uh, there is. You know the small talk code describing the virtual machine, and then what that code was was essentially using small talk as pseudocode to describe the Drottel small talk interpreter. Now the Drottel at the time was a machine that was about a hundred times faster than what anybody else had available to them, and the interpreter was implemented in microcode. Uh, but the theory was that sort of the, the bill of goods that. Uh, uh, Xerox sold us. Actually, there wasn't any money involved in this at all. Was that all we need? All we needed to do was build a computer, implement that virtual machine based on the instructions in the blue book, and then we could load this virtual image, and the whole small talk environment would be running. Uh, and and to help us get us loaded, by the way, there is a trace of the first. I think it was thousand bytecodes executing. So as you brought your uh, interpreter up. You, you could, if you had a trace in your interpreter loop, you could trace through. And if you know, if you got through the first thousand bytecodes right, you were well on your way to the thing working. And that was the theory, at least. So, uh, so, so, so we went off, and um, we used our Pascal compiler, of course, to implement the uh, the um, the virtual machine. We actually. Some of the first work on it we actually did on a PDP-10, a X System 10 time sharing system, and then we got uh, a, a 68,000 computer we could start using. And so, uh, we, yeah, so we we did it. We followed the recipe. We implemented the uh, the virtual machine in Pascal, and uh, and eventually, and and we hooked it up to a terminal, a Tektronix graphics terminal, like a graphics thing. Uh, and eventually, this actually came out on that terminal. Now, this took about an hour to display because it's because we were actually, you know, after we did the bitblit, we'd then raster out over a serial port to this thing, the in individual things, and 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 we first time we ran it, we only got about this far before we ran out of display memory uh, because all the, what we discovered was all this. This this background all the, was uh, this terminal was you know its display memory was all optimized to store little lines and stuff with a lot of black, 
right? And so when you were sending out these pat these half tone patterns, it just totally none of the optimizations in the terminal to save memory work, and it just totally filled up memory. And so our first hack there was to uh, figure out a way to turn off the the half toning, um, and it, and then it made it come up a whole lot faster. But so it came up. But it was kind of disappointing that it took uh, an hour. <laughs> not, not very interactive. <laughs> uh, so, um, so if you read the Green Book, or any of the stories in the, in the Green Book, uh, you know, we did this, and people, several other companies did this. And, and everybody's experience was kind of comparable. And there was a whole lot of disappointment. And, well, this, this magical small talk thing is, it seems not very magical at all. And, and most people gave up. And as a matter of fact, most of the group that I was in at, tech, at, at Tektronics doing this kind of, kind of gave up. And a bunch of them actually went to this new company called, at the time, Serial Logic, uh, which eventually became known as Gemstone and now known as Gemtalk. But uh, so, so, so that's a whole other story. But uh, so I was left there, and I sort of scratched my head and said, it really can't be this slow. I mean, there, there, there's just not so so much going on in the basic small talk bytecode interpreter that it's taking this so long to do this. Uh, and I went off and built from scratch a a new interpreter implemented in assembly language with and, and started doing a lot of some monitoring and instrumentation. And we eventually uh, got up to the point where we had a, a small talk system. Uh, that was running uh, uh, faster than than not a Xerox Dorado, which was a really fast machine, but a machine they called a Dolphin, which was considered to be usable quality. Uh, and uh, at the same time, so I, by then I was working in this group, Tektronics Labs, which was building this big CS-oriented research group and had built this 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 workstation called a Magnolia. And we got small talk, got my small talk interpreter up and running on it. And we had this whole lab of mostly PhD computer scientists who were supposed to be there doing interesting stuff. Um, and it turned out small talk was the most interesting programming environment they had to work on. And so over the course of a couple of years, uh, most of this 50 to 75 person research group was using small talk as their primary uh, programming language. Um, and, uh, you know, we demoed this around the company and showed it off to a lot of people, and there was a lot of excitement about it. Uh, down here, this link uh, at the bottom, on, on my website, I have lots of the original documents and even some of the source code of the original interpreters I did. And uh, so if you're interested in any of the kind of the early history of how Smalltalk got out of Xerox, that's a good place to look. Uh, you don't need probably need to remember that whole URL. If you just remember wurfsbrock.com slash Allen, you can probably find it. So, so, so yeah, we started with the Magnolia. Then we got the idea, well, let's actually make a, a commercial product out of this thing. And so we created what was known as the 4404, which was, uh, which we uh, announced in 1984 in August, and we shipped in January of 85. Uh, which was really the first commercial small talk workstation that was widely available. Um, you can see it says here the low price of fifteen thousand uh, dollars. This is the machine that's on the on, on the video we saw yesterday, um, and that that eventually turned into over the next couple of years we evolved it we. The more powerful machines with more powerful processors, we moved to a 32-bit implementation, no object table, lots, lots of VM in, in a virtual memory. Sorry, a virtual machine innovation. Um, so, so you know, at the time we were pretty much the, one of the real centers of the small talk world. Uh, we eventually got 88. This is this is a project that yeah. That time at the VM and doing all stuff. Remember that? Well, the VM team, so I, I, I was the main architect of the VM, and 
it, it kind of depend where we were, like when we were doing a new VM, there was more people. But the core VM team was me and another guy, Pat Cadell. And then there was two or three other people that worked on various parts of, of the VM at, at various times. And then there was a, a much larger group working on image level stuff and the hardware and the marketing and, and, and you'd be surprised, probably lots of names that you've heard uh, associated with Smalltalk would one way or another were associated with, with Tektronix and stuff. So yeah, so this is, uh, by 1988 we developed uh, what I think was the first real color uh, small talk 18. Rebecca was the project leader of this project and, and stuff. There's there's an Oopsla paper on this, um, but uh, but but we weren't just building these products. I, like I said, small talk was being actively used inside Tektronix to actually do things. One of the things was a system called the Analog Design System, and if I think a lot of you know, and he's been here in the past, Dale Hendricks, and Dale Hendricks was the driver behind this project. This this was, was his baby for a number of years. And remember, Tektronix built oscilloscopes. And so analog electronics down to the chip level, and they, they did their own chips and everything, uh, uh, was really a key technology. And, and, and they built this complete CAD system for analog IC design, which was used until very, very recently uh, uh, to, to design all their chips. So that was one of the things, sort of the real world things that was done at Tektronix. Uh, another very real world thing, um, the whole generation of uh, oscilloscopes that came out starting in late 1980s, early 1990s, had Smalltalk embedded in them to do their user interfaces. Uh, and um, Rebecca was also somewhat involved with that project. She was actually involved with working with, Tektronix was one of the first people to work with OTI and, and helped fund actually the development of Envy. Uh, and, and it was actually OTI Smalltalk de developed using Envy that was embedded in, in these, uh, these oscilloscope products, right? So, so we were, Tektronix is very, very much focused on doing real engineering of real products using Smalltalk. And over about, yeah, about, over about a, well, about a 10 year period, if you go the, the full span of it, uh, we'll, we'll get a bit here in a second, kind of what happened in the end. But let's, so kind of going back to the, some of these first machines where we first actually got Smalltalk up and we got, you know, we come up and it looked kind of like this. This isn't actually it because this says version two, you'll know it up there, and it was Smalltalk 80 version one. Yeah. Uh, I would. Oh, I don't know. Rebecca is shaking her head. No spectrum analyzers. So, yeah, and, and I don't know if either of us actually know after we left Tektronix where this stuff leaked out to and stuff over a while, but. Um, but anyway, so you know, when we first got a real small talk up, and you know, and we could browse, and we kind of, oh yeah, here's a workspace. We can type three plus four, and it says seven. Uh, so we kind of got a sense of what this was. But almost everybody who, who sat down in front of this for the first time um, said, "Where's the program?" Now, I don't know how many of you had that experience the first time you sat in front of Smalltalk, but we're programmers. And so you sit down in front of this thing and says, this is, this is an environment for programming. And you say, where is the program? I can't find the program. Um, and, um, you know, over the course of time, we learn that it's really not about the program. It's about creating a environment and ecosystem of objects and that you can start off these objects doing things and then they they have behaviors and those behaviors produce effects and that's the program 
right? But it's, it's, it's that you're in this image, this image of active objects, uh, and it was great what you could do with it. Everybody loved it. But, but there is, was kind of this uncomfortable thing, but what about the program? We're engineers, we're software engineers, and what we're supposed to be producing, our work product, our programs, and they just kind of get subsumed into this environment, and then it's hard to f identify, is, is this method part of my program, or is this part of the environment and stuff? Okay, and we experienced probably all the issues that all of you have experienced was that, you know, the first response is, well, you just file out what you, your work, you know, and, well, you discovered that wasn't so great. You know, you have a bunch of file outs, and you then try to file them back in, and it doesn't actually work, you know, that in many cases. You might have ordering dependencies. You might have conflicts with different classes. You, you mix up. You combine file-ins that were created independently and they have conflicts with each other because they, they both try to change the uh, system classes. And, and me, as a programming language guy, I was even uh, a big concern was, well, there, there didn't seem to be any fixed semantics to what those file-ins meant. And I'll get back to that. Uh, and then there's this idea of, of this virtual image. Well, it's great that you could save this virtual image and restart it. But how did it get to the state it was in? That was, you know, something we always wanted to know our programs. Could we, could we ever reproduce it again? Uh, what if we make mistakes? Can you do, could you do things to an image that become unrecoverable? And then what do you do? Uh, you know, do you get it? Can, could it be corrupted to the point you can't recover? And, and then, of course, again, this issue of how do you get multiple people working on a single virtual image? Um, and a particular thing that in a, an organization like Tektronix came up with, uh, you know, re repeatable deployment. What if, what if we need to uh, regenerate this whole thing again? What if we find that there is a bug in this product we shipped two years ago? Uh, today it would be a security bug. Those days, I don't know, it would be some problem and stuff. We didn't worry about security back then. Uh, and, and we needed to go back and fix it. Could we, could we in fact... Uh, Using any of the normal techniques we knew about, um, you know, how how could we possibly go back and fix those stuff? Now, that didn't, like I say, that didn't stop Tektronix from moving forward with these technologies, but it did cause us to put a lot of effort into thinking about how to solve these problems. Some of which we, work we did internally, others we did with partners, like working with OTI and, and Envy and stuff. Um, but you know. If, in, in retrospect, if I look at it, part of the problem we had there, part of the uncomfort was that an image, a virtual image, is this really organic thing. It grows. It, 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 it grows, and how it grows depends upon how it's watered and where the light comes in and who, who trims some areas. And we were an engineering company. We were, you know, answered mechanical processes. How do you stamp things out? Boim, 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 boim. And so there's this real tension between software as an organic thing. This is, almost goes back to Rebecca's talk yesterday, you know, uh, is, is, it li is there life in it? You know, what, what are the centers of life in, in, in your image and stuff versus something that doesn't have any life at all, is, is just, uh, is nothing but process. So one of the first things we did, uh, I working with one of my colleagues, uh, Brian Wilkerson, we, uh, we, we tried to develop something we called modular small talk. Uh, and, and we presented a paper on this at Uppsala 88, I think it was. Um, and, and the idea of modular small talk was, uh, what, well, what if we take all the things we like about small talk as a language, the semantics of objects and stuff, but what if we kind of give it a more traditional syntactic source code structure and stuff, and in particular, give it, you know, imports and exports, much like what we had back in Pascal, 
So when we took these, uh, these individual modules of source code and we loaded them into the image or, or assembled them and stuff, then the imports and exports told us how things fit together and stuff. Um, and uh, so, so that was, was the first, that, so that was, we were working on that in the, the late 1980s. But also that was around the same time that uh, sort of the business cycle of Tektronix, they'd gone, we'd gone through this whole cycle of building these work, workstations and we'd sold thousands of them, which, uh, but, but the idea of a workstation that was specifically for small talk was kind of going out of vogue. Uh, general purpose workstations were more popular and, it, and there didn't seem to be a lot of long-term business viability in building machines specifically for small talk. And the management of Tektronix also didn't understand the poss that there was any possibility of a viable business built around pure software, just selling the software rather than the hardware. Uh, and so that business kind of uh, wound down and, uh, you know, I did the good thing, the thing that any good passionate technologist does is I started a company called Instantiations. Um, it's loosely, it's loosely the parent of the current thing called Instantiations. There's a thread that runs through the, the whole thing there. Um, and, and so Instantiations, uh, one of our first products was something we called Application Organizer. And this is Application Organizer Plus. And, and what Application Organizer tried to do was kind of discipline the use of file ins. And so uh, file ins were treated more formally and we called them packages. Um, we, we, as we enhanced the tools so that as you were editing in the browser, you'll notice this is a five pane browser and this pane over here is actually a list of packages. So the changes you would make would actually be directed specifically to specific packages and stuff. Uh, and there was user interface affordances like these, you can't see this very well, but these are bold. When something is bold, it means it's in the currently selected package. And if it's not bold, you still see it, but it's, but it's, it's somewhere else. And there's a lot of stuff. And then there was another tool we called a package organizer that lets you move things around packages. And you could save packages. Uh, and you could, you could load them back in. But still the loading was fundamentally a file-in process. And, and you had a lot of the same sorts of conflicts, possibilities, and stuff you had before. And so our next big product we called Convergence. And Edwina we had an industry partner in doing this, a customer, Texaco, who was doing a big small talk product. And, and they were concerned about these same sorts of issues. And we sort of said, well, why don't you fund us to build the tools you need to do this? So Convergence was sort of the next generation of it. Uh, and, and it stored the, it, it actually versioned the packages. An app organizer packages were still just stored in files in the file system. Uh, in, uh, in convergence, the packages were stored in a repository, and you'd have multiple versions of, of packages in the repository. One, but one of the really key things that it is, we call it atomic loading and unloading. So, so rather than just doing a file in process where you, you go through the file and you, you interpret it essentially and file it in, there was actually an intelligent loader that would look at would look at the package that was being loaded, look at what's currently in the image, see if there's any conflicts that existed, for example, between packages you'd already loaded. So say if you had two packages and they both try to define uh, a foo method on object, the first one would load and it would, it would extend object with a foo method. And then you came to load the second package and, and, and the loader would look and say, oh, well, there's, this is trying to load a, a foo method on object, but there's already is one that came from this other package. And so I'm, I'm gonna, it, it would refuse to load that package it was because the idea was a, a package was all, would always load as an atomic unit, in which case you got everything that was in that package 
or it wouldn't load at all. You'd never get any partial effects and stuff. Um, and, and, and another thing we started working here with in, in here in Convergence, extending the tools so not only did they work on what's in the image, but would work on things that weren't in the image. So you could browse packages that were just out in, in the repository before they actually got loaded and such. Um, and out of that, the way we started doing that, we started talk, talking about the declarative structure of small talk programs. Uh, and basically saying, well, there are certain things about Smalltalk programs that don't have syntax in the language, uh, but, th but are really fundamental parts of the language. Uh, and when you take a, 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 a file in that looks like this, this looks like it has meaning, but in fact, it's just a bunch of Smalltalk ex expressions, particularly up in this area. Uh, and what this actually means actually depends on the meaning of point. In, in your current image. It depends on the meaning of the subclass blah, blah, blah method on point in the current image, which could be anything. Uh, you know, you go further down, point, comment, colon. Again, who knows what this comment thing is. Uh, when you get down to point, comment, class, point, class, point. You, yeah. I mean, well, this is just a expression. Okay, send class to point and then send... You know, it could do whatever it does. This this is actually firing off a little sub-interpreter, right? You're, again, you're sending a message, a message to point, uh, and, and that method, as it runs, goes, and now it starts parsing things from the file. But again, kind of from a technical language design perspective, you look at this and say, I can't know what this means. It, it could, this could mean anything. Uh, I, I have... If, if I really want to manage these things independently of what's in an image, I need to actually have some solid ground to stand on. And so, by the way, so this, you'll see a number of these in the rest of my talk. This is a transparency for an overhead projector, for those of you who've never seen such a thing. Uh, and this is how we used to give presentations. Uh, and I have boxes of these. Uh, some of them are, are on the, the website I pointed you to. So, uh, so we kind of said, well, we, so we need to go look at this and say, what's really going on here and, and systematize this? And we said, okay, what are the basic units of defining small talk applications? You have class definitions, you have method definitions, you have global variables, you have pool definitions. Uh, you know, we actually have pool definitions and then pool variable definitions, and then you have some sort of concept of how do you initialize this whole thing? What's, what's the order? And that these were actually units of work you could talk about. So, um, so we built this thing for Texaco, uh, running on part place small talk at the time. Object works, I think, was what was they were calling it at the time. Object works small talk. And, uh, and, and we, uh, we started talking to the Digitalk folks, and Digitalk at the time built the best $99 small talk for the IBM PC in the world. Um, and they discovered that big companies like Texaco didn't take them seriously because their product didn't cost enough. <laughs> uh, and, and they didn't just want to say, well, let's change our price from $99 to $2,000 because uh, that would be too, too blatant. And they said, there are things these people are working for, and, and you guys at Instantiations seem to know how to work with these people, these big companies and stuff. And so, 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 uh, so we were acquired by Digitalk, basically. And one of the, the objectives of that, one of the immediately was to say, well, how do we bring this convergence technology to support Smalltalk V, Digitalk Smalltalk? And, and again, this is... Is, is, is some slides I found from a very early presentation of that period saying what it is we wanted to do for Digitalk Smalltalk. And you know, the, old, the goal over here is right, create an environment that allows organizations, not people, because the, the customers were organizations, companies like Texaco, not Joe the programmer, okay? Uh, but would allow organizations to create, deliver, and maintain com complex small talk applications 
over extended periods of time. So it's not just something you do one time, but this has to go on and on. And the people who are still in, in the, the small talk business to, today, like Syncom and Instantiations, really understand that these companies are working over extended periods of time and there's, they need support, right? So that's, uh, and so some of the requirements, right? And you had to, You know, you, you, you had to, yes, yeah, structure what goes in the application. You had to help teams coordinate their, your work. Uh, you, you had to allow uh, reconstruction from source code. Uh, uh, you you uh, needed, wanted to minimize how dependent the applications were from underlying changes of the image. Uh, but we knew, we knew what was special about Smalltalk, and said, so we wanted to maintain a productive, interactive, incremental, small talk style of development from doing all this. So the trick is, how do you do all this uh, and, and, but yet not break the small talk experience? And sort of the, the catch all of this was that we wanted to change small talk development from editing an image to defining an application, right? The, the, that's how people would think about it. Um, and so that theme, Sorry, this is another slide deck. Yeah, this isn't very readable, is it, unfortunately? So this is the next advance in presentation technology, which was uh, using color printers to print on these transparencies and, <laughs> and, and such. Uh, but this is saying, uh, you know, but we kind of, at the time, we were blaming it on the image. The image is the source of the problem, right? I'll read some of these for you since you probably can't read them. It says problem areas are change management change coordination, uh, conflicting changes, conflicting names, fragile tools, fragile applications, release coupling, application size. I don't know what that one says. Application, application extraction, we all know that one. Uh, you know, all those things. And, and the, the, what are the three sources of the problem? The image, the image, and the image, right? Uh, I gotta read this, over. It's, it's actually much more readable over here. Yeah, the editing paragraph, paradigm, uh, develop, you know, tools versus application combined in the image, uh, development time versus deployment time, classes, uh, so, anyway, you get the idea. It's, it's all about the image, right? The image is kind of the source of the problem, and we're kind of saying, you gotta get, we got to get somehow out of this image dependency and into something else. And so the solution was change the conceptual basis of developing Smalltalk from going in and editing on this image to one of constructing these packages, modules in other words, that you would then assemble into an image. Uh, but still keep everything the way we're used to. So, uh, and the implementation of this was define these basic artifacts that define what, what the Smalltalk program was, uh, and then build the tools that operate upon those and, and maintain those in repositories that teams could work with and stuff. Sorry these blue slides didn't show up better. So that became what became known as Team V, which was uh, all then a, eventually a component. Team V was initially an independent product, then eventually was bundled together into VSE, Visual Smalltalk Enterprise. Uh, VSE was basically a combination of three things: the base Smalltalk V system, Team V doing that for the development tools and parts, which was the visual designer and stuff. And uh, so it was quite successful, actually. Um, and we had many, many big corporate customers using Team V to do development. Uh, so, so some of the things we added in the Team V time frame then were uh, clusters. So in addition to packages, you, have to, you need to talk about compositions of packages, groups of packages that work together and stuff. And you also sometimes you want to talk about generically structuring things. Other times you want to pin down specific versions. I want, I want package A 1.0.2 and I want package 
B2.5.3, and, and clusters were a way to describing those sorts of combinations. Uh, the package migrator was a, 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 a follow-on to our atomic loader and unloader, where we could take any set of packages or clusters uh, and, and atomically load it or remove it from an image or to replace it. We call that migration. So you might have version 1.0 of an application active running your image and somebody gives you a version 2.0 and you could migrate the version 2.0 in. Things that were the same were left the same. Things that were replaced were replaced. Things that didn't exist were removed. Uh, very cool. Um, and, and we started to develop a complete model of what programs were and, and our tool API that operated against those models. Okay, and that model reflected the declarative structure of the program. So, um, so now these are slides. I think these are a bit more readable. These are from uh, uh, an invited talk I gave at uh, Uppsala 96 ab about this technology. Um, and uh, so, so yeah, so the first thing we did, we defined, we talked about the abstract object model of what programs were. You started this idea of you have a program, various sorts of uh, program aggregates like class definitions, program definitions, pool definitions, program elements are, are methods and class variables. All, again, all those declarative pieces that make up a program. Uh, and you could think of those like this in terms of an object model. You could also think about them in terms of an abstract BNF. There's not necessarily any syntax behind this, but a BNF still describes the structure. And, and this model of programs, by the way, well, another way to think about this is it's just describing a full AST of the entire thing, right? Uh, and this model has actually gotten to then the anti Smalltalk definition. It's the way the Smalltalk language is described in, in ANSI Smalltalk. The, uh, so, so one of the things that this allowed us to do, Smalltalk tools up to this time had always been built on reflection, and, and, and which means actually looking at the actual runtime data structures of, that, that the interpreter used and stuff, and that's how the program was described. You would compile a method, and you compiled method would be in the system, and then you'd reflect on that, and that's how you'd get stuff. Uh, the, the idea was to, the, uh, the declarative model of the program uh, didn't replace reflection, but it sits side by side with reflection and stuff. So reflection is about the actual runtime state of the program and the image. The program model was about what the program wrote, right? One of the problems, some of the problems with reflection is reflection every small talk implementation is a little bit different in how it's implemented and that tends to show up in the reflection API, right? So one way to visualize this is in traditional small talk tools, you have an image, you have, think of it as the runtime program model, simply the objects you reflect over, and you have tools like browsers that go and directly work against that model. What, uh, the, what you do when you have this abstract program model is uh, you still have the runtime program model, but you have this other model of, of the actual program structure in the same image, and, and it can operate against the runtime model, but, but the tools operate against the abstract program model. And so an effect that it makes here can indirectly have an effect on the actual runtime run system, but it's going through a layer of indirection. Now, uh, today we'd say that the objects of this program, abstract program model here are mirrors on the runtime model, right? So that's, that's basically it was a mirrors-based design. And, uh, and so, so now if you start thinking about you have this basic thing, idea and this sort of self-contained description of a program, well, why can't you have more than one of these in one image, right? And one of them is maybe looking here at the runtime program model. 
The other one isn't looking at anything. It hasn't been compiled yet. It hasn't been, been loaded. But the tools are both using the same API, so all your tools can work against unloaded code as well as it can work against loaded code. Okay. So now, let's say you've done that. Well, let's say you want to make this second program model that's modeled in the same image executable, but you don't want it, you know, the, this image is already tied up with model. Well, what could you do? Well, instead of using ref, direct reflection, you could just load this into another independent image and use some sort of debug API. And so now you have tools, one set of tools here that's operating on this sort of self-reflecting on the running image, another set of tools looking at another program that's over here running in a separate image. And if you take this to the, to the next step, you say, well, why would we, for the most part, unless we're, except for when we're working on tools themselves, why do we ever actually want to reflect back? Why don't we just make this the normal way you run things? Okay. And by the way, you know, one of the characteristics of this, if it's not, may not be obvious, is the base class library you're using up here now to implement these tools can be completely different from the base class library you're using down here. And there's no concern here about how do you remove the tools from this, from this image down here because there are no tools down there. Okay. So, so, so the basic idea here is this new architecture. The user just constructs this, this declarative model of their program that's buildable from source. The, uh, the target class library is completely separate and distinct from the implementation of the development environment. Uh, changes to the pr application program don't break the development tools. Changes to the development tools don't break the application. There isn't any release coupling between the two, uh, but it still has the full incremental interactive small talk style of development that everybody loves. And so the question was, could you actually do this? And the answer was yes, because we did it. So, so we built this prototype. Uh, this is late, very late days of Digitalk, very early days of Park Place Digitalk. I don't know exactly when it came up. Uh, uh, which is the prototype we called Firewall, and it did exactly this, using two, two, using Digitalk Smalltalk class library, basically, and stuff, built on, uh, evolved from Team V. Uh, and we, we did, we did interesting things with it. We, uh, John did, uh, showed a demo of a program that did 42. We actually uh, did a computation. We did 3 plus 4. That's the traditional Smalltalk test. Um, I actually may, on a, somewhere in some disk, have a, a Windows XE file that actually does this, uh, that was generated by this. It was less than 10K. Uh, we built utilities, uh, Unix-style command line utilities. They were typically 300 to 200K in size. Uh, and, and we did this with GUI applications. Uh, and, and one of the interesting things we did right after the the merger with Park Place Digitalk was, um, you know, and on the Park Place side of the world, um, what they, what Park Place was currently running was a virtual image whose bits directly derived from Smalltalk 72, uh, you know, through through a cloning process, step after step after step, you know, and uh, which actually proves it's possible to do that. But uh, but we actually regenerated the, the Park Place image from scratch, from source code, using this process. So like no Smalltalk 76 bits at all. It, uh, it started with source code. Okay. I guess. I'll let you connect. Okay. So so we did it. It worked. 
Um, unfortunately, this was in 1990, late 1995, early 1996. And, and so Digitalk and Park Place merged. And the reason they merged was because, one of the reasons was because Smalltalk was so successful that IBM had decided to enter the, mar the market and everybody was afraid that we were going to be crushed by IBM. And so he said, it wouldn't be better if we all just got together <laughs> to, to battle IBM. Uh, and Jigsaw was the name, and, and so the grand vision was somehow we're going to combine uh, Digitalk Smalltalk and Park Place Smalltalk into some common thing, and Jigsaw was kind of the code word for that project. Um, and now, as you guys know, all know, it's, re it's really hard to move an application from one version of Smalltalk to another one, because once you get beyond the, the level, the method level syntax of the language, they're very different, right? Uh, so I'll get into that more of that in a minute, but that's, that was the flaw of the, the basic argument for doing that merger. But, but as this was happening, you know, you see there's already concern about Java was emerging and, and, and there was, had been for a long time competition between Smalltalk and C++. And we were starting to get more and more feedback about the deployment pain from major customers and, you know, sort of this model here. Smalltalk was great for programmer productivity, but in terms of delivery and maintenance, it, 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 it didn't seem to work as well as the C family of Java, at least from the perspective of the customers and stuff. Uh, and so, again, one of the things we were hoping to do as Jigsaw was say, well, okay, now we want to bring this firewall vision into this, to, 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 into Jigsaw to help address this problem. And, you know, then the vision was... Well, first of all, the vision was, well, then you'd have both high programmer productivity and high deliverability and maintenance better than any of these other guys. But also by using, you know, you could have a single image that could target lots of different environments, servers and different kinds of clients. Uh, this doesn't show it, but you could imagine targeting Digitalk legacy image versus Park Place legacy image, all driven off the common set of development tools and stuff. So, so that was the vision that we were all working on at that time. But the problem kind of ran into a brick wall. And the brick wall, well, I, I see that there's three components of that brick wall. Uh, the biggest ones were the rapid emergence of the web and Java's association with the web. Even though Java was actually pretty useless for any of this stuff, it grabbed the mind share that, that small talk in like a six month period went from being the leading edge innovative programming tool to being legacy. <laughs> yeah, literally to being legacy because it, it didn't adapt to the web. And one of the reasons it didn't adapt to, to the web was it had these very big corporate customers who were building applications. And so instead of you know, looking at what's really going on in the web world, we were all focused on what does Texaco need? What does God, every insurance company in North America need? What does every major bank, you know, they're all here beating on us to get this stuff done. And the last thing they wanted to hear was in the first release of Jigsaw was going to be kind of this combined, mixed up image, both things. So they didn't want to hear anything about something that would uh, cause them to start making big changes to what they've already done. And so, uh, I, most of you know the rest of the story, uh, Park Place Digitalk sort of <laughs> went off the deep end. Uh, those of us in Portland, we, uh, we re-instantiated, we launched version two of instantiations uh, and, and started doing some interesting things, but that's a different talk. Uh, but I do want to say here, I'm, getting, I'm kind of getting near wrapping up here. Um, Certainly, a lot of these ideas, you know, you know, live on. If you look at at, at modern small talk tools, uh, you know, you have package browsers and you and you have repository browsers that are very similar to things we're doing. And in fact, one of the people at at Digitalk who was one of the main tool builders, again, was Dale Hendricks. 
uh, who's had a whole lot of influence on these tools and, and other small talk tools and stuff. And so, so Dell has carried forward the flag of, of this style of development. But, I, I, but so, so now I want to wrap up with, uh, I want to get back to the virtual image and I want to get to, back to this basic issue of is the virtual image the problem? Uh, you know, and it's something we needed to get rid of. Um, you know, I I don't think there's really any serious argument you can make that you need to do source code management. You, it's good to put your code in the repositories. It's good to have tools that help you manage multiple versions of code and share code among multiple users. It's good to have a repro reproducible process to combine that code. But, but the image is also really neat. Right? There's a lot of stuff you can do in that image environment if you're willing to live in that organic sort of world we showed before. And uh, kind of tying back to yesterday's talk, the, I, the, the reality of the day is Millions of programmers every day today sit down in front of their computers and they're writing code that are working within a dynamic, persistent, stateful, non-restartable, uh, non-rebuildable, object-based computing environment. It's called the web, right? Uh, and it's not a small talk virtual image, but it's very similar to a small talk image in a very massive scale. Uh, you know, our servers and clients to some degree are the objects. The, the HTTP requests that go back and forth are the messages. Um, you sit down and start building something, you're going to say, how am I going to reboot this, the whole image from scratch? You're just going to say, well, what's it like today? I guess I'm going to try to do something. Um, you have third party services you use who occasionally go and they change their APIs and don't tell you and suddenly your things stop working and you have to cope with it. So, so in fact, the reality today of software development in the world is very much like working in a small talk virtual image. That's what that is. It's called, I, I guess I should have stepped forward. Yes, it's called the internet. Yeah, so, so the, the, the internet is our virtual image today. That is the world, and like I was saying, it is growing. It's growing to encompass every device we work with. It's going to be in our desks, in our chairs, and in our shoes, okay? And none of that is ever going to be restartable from, from fresh source code, rebootable and stuff. And so I guess the challenge is uh, if, if we start thinking about the, the, the image in this way, um, and if we use our experience as small talk programmers in, in, the, in, in uh, working with virtual images, uh, can we, uh, you know, can we do some creative things to help developers in this world of ambient internet programming? Uh, and so, so the challenge, I guess, to all of you is, if you guys understand virtual images, think bigger. <laughs> you know. Uh, well, let's take you know, all our small talk experience and create really great programming experiences that span the entire ambient web. Because I think most of you would agree there aren't a lot of great programming experience for what most people have to do today. So, thank you. So, any questions? Yeah. Sure. Yeah, yeah. I'll. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, it, it looks to me that there were some constraints at that time that now are not the same. For example, removing the uh, tools from the image, you had to do that because there was not enough memory, and maybe because of some uh, licensing problems, uh, but now open source and really for memory, you, you don't need really to remove the tools when you deploy an application on a small uh, Well, kind of but, but, but those weren't the only concern. I mean, sure, some, some, those were some of the concerns, but 
But there's always, one of the concern was always a security concern, that if the tools are there, somebody might find a way to get at them. You know, you think you've hidden them, but there is... No, but you don't need a tool to send a message to class and, and you know, uh, I don't know, and do a compile and do whatever. So now my question was, I mean, do you think that those constraints uh, are still valid today? Well, and, and if not, what? Well, so, so here's, the, here's the biggest thing, I think, about tool, tool, tool coupling. I really think it's important, or it's at least really desirable, to, for your tools to be able to evolve at a different rate than what your application evolves at. And, and to the degree, and to evolve at different rates, and to be decoupled to the degree that if an application error does it cause the tools to fail? Because that's exactly when you don't want the tools to fail is when your application breaks. And so the more coupled they are, um, and, and if nothing else, it, it's actually conceptually a lot cleaner, it, right? Nothing in the firewall model says stops you from hacking on tools or hacking on your app. You just have to think when you're doing it, am I working on tools now or am I working on, on my app? And that's a good distinction to make. Yeah. That's right. That's right. That's right. Particularly, particularly if you could carry along the class, the base class library it used. You know, and that's right. That's a problem with you know enterprise maintenance. Of, of you know, the class library would change out from underneath programs and require people to do maintenance of their apps. That was otherwise unnecessary. Go ahead. Oh, yeah, so to understand it better, so the problem is not the image, but the coupling between the tools. And that's one of the problems. Yeah, that's what, that's absolutely one of the so problems. You like the image. Hmm? I mean, yeah, absolutely. I mean, the image is great. It's great to be able to save. I, you know, at, at instantiations, after the second instantiations, reinstantiations, a big project we did was a, a Java compiler called Jove. And we used VA Java to develop that. That was an image-based, actually a small talk image-based Java development environment. And it was wonderful. I, you know, I would have half-compiled programs with their, with their internal representation there in the image that I would work on for weeks and weeks at a time as I was debugging comp optimization algorithms and stuff. And so, so lots of good things about images, but, uh, and which is kind of what I'm in, you know. There, there's, there are good things about this environment and stuff, and it's, it's simply reality that there. So, you know, we should... We should embrace those things that are good and, and work on those things and, and kind of forget about the things that, you know, the baggage that we don't need. So, okay, okay. Uh, anything else? Well, this is probably about all the time we have, but if I'll be around. Thank you. Yeah.